or price transparency uh, uh, on, on forestry products. And he asked Stein, can you please look into that? And I said, of course, I can do that for you because I was in a, a quarantine back then. It was in 2012. I was in a quarantine from a previous job. And, uh, and uh, so I had, had uh, plenty of time. And, and uh, so I used one month and I studied the, the international commodity markets. And uh, I looked what uh, other exchanges and commodities uh, were doing. Uh, and we uh, quite rapidly concluded that the, the, the local market in Norway and, and Sweden on, on Solog and, and Pulpwood was too small uh, to make an exchange on. So we decided then to, to, to move out in the, in the value chain and, uh, and we looked at pulp uh, specifically. And we looked at the history of pulp. We looked at how it has been treated in the, uh, how it has been done in the financial market. And we saw that there had been some previous attempts. And, uh, and we also studied the reasons why they didn't make it. And I think that's really important. If you go into this, you have to study those who has made it and those who hasn't made it. Um, uh, and and uh, when we studied this, when I made this big study, we, we of course analyzed a lot of different perspectives. Of course, we had to analyze the size of the pulp market. And, and if you look at uh, this figure here, uh, you see that the, the, the fiber market uh, as a whole uh, it's it's huge and it's it's growing. It's uh, 450 million tons. And if you look at uh, what is put into making all these different fiber products, you have the value of market pulp that is part of the, of, of the input, uh, and it has the value of about 17 70 billion US dollars. So we could kind of kick off uh, that the the value and the size of the market is big enough. To, to, to make a, 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 financial, a financial market. And uh, I mean, how much is 70 billion US dollars? It's kind of hard to put it into perspective, but we found that it would be about 60, 70% of the world uh, aluminum market. So it's quite significant. And as you know, uh, aluminum has uh, a good uh, commodity market. We also had to, to look at and study the volatility of the product uh, in a historical perspective. And uh, this is uh, the, the CIF China based uh, NBSK. NBSK is uh, Northern Bleached uh, Soft Craft Pulp. And you see that uh, the prices are quite volatile. Uh, you see prices uh, below, uh, how much is it, uh, or down to 500 US dollars and prices almost up to $1,000 a, a ton. And you know, if you're making newspaper or if you're making tissue, tissue, it's quite a big difference if you buy at 500 or if you buy at 1,000. So we found that the volatility was there. We also uh, compared the volatility uh, uh, to other commodities. And at the very right of that the last diagram, you can see when you compare it to, to cotton, copper, or, or oil, you can see that uh, volatility is uh, significant. So then we can kind of tick off uh, that box as well. Um, so then we kind of decided that we would uh, uh, establish uh, a project. And this happened back in 2012 and 2013. And what I'm going to tell you now, I hope it's not going to scare you off, because I will start out by saying that if I knew back then what I know today, I'm not sure if we would have started the project. Uh, having said that, I will also say that I have no regrets. I'm very happy we did it. What I'm trying to say is that I think that the experience of everyone building a new business into a new market is that it's very, very heavy. It's a long run. You have to, you have to make sure that you are able to stay in there. And this story is going to, to show you that uh, it's, it's been a struggle, but like I said, we're happy that we did it. So what we did then, uh, 
uh, what we did, and after I did my case study, I think it was 150 pages of case study done in one month. So it was quite rapid work. But then we established the product and, and, and we set the, uh, the company strategy. And I'm not going to, to, to read all this to you, but we, uh, we, we, we decided that we would like to be the world leading marketplace for pulp and paper derivatives. Pulp and paper derivatives. So everything we are doing is focused on pulp and paper fiber. Um, we also uh, 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 saw that our role, we have to take a role in this market because it's not been done before. Yes, um, uh, CME, they listed a contract back, I think it was back in 2008. That's when the financial crisis really started. And they delisted the, the contract uh, a couple of years after. But they didn't do very much promoting and, and they were not working the market uh, actively. So what we saw is that we need to do something more than just list the product. We need to in make involvement from the industry. We need to do a lot of education because uh, the pop and paper industry is very traditional. Uh, nothing wrong about that. But they had their way of doing business and they were used to sitting on the price risk uh, on their books. So making an opportunity for them to offload risk was something new. Yes, there was an OTC market, but I would say that the OTC market was less than 5% of, of market pulp. So the OTC market was very small. I believe that we would have had an easier job if the OTC market was bigger. Also, we decided that if we uh, shall be able to do this, we need to team up with some really big and good strategic partners. Um, and, and so we did, uh, and it was really important for, for, for the, for, for, uh, being able to make this structure and then get back to how we did it. So uh, that, that's kind of, we had to, to make the, the, the company strategy and then uh, we had to go for, uh, for the license. And you know, if you want to be a regular, regulated derivatives exchange, you need to have a license uh, to perform. So for Norexico, we are based in Norway, as Jordan said, uh, we uh, applied for a license with the Norwegian FSA. And that, that is a process of, um, uh, it, it's up to a year. Uh, when we got the license uh, from the Norwegian FSA, it was passported throughout Europe. So that was really smooth. So then we got the license for, for, for Europe. And then, you know, we were, uh, Norexico is oriented on, uh, on the world market, so we needed access to other parts of the world as well. So we either have, now we either have a license or we have partners in order to get access to different parts of the world. And that is, uh, that's a heavy job. That's a heavy compliance job. You need to do that in order to get all these licenses. And, and of course, in order to report uh on the license and to say then uh, when we had the license and during that period of time we had to build the exchange setup and um, i believe that our exchange setup is quite equal to to most setups but i'll use some time on it in order to make you understand how we do it uh, norexico is then the regulated marketplace uh, like Jordan said, we don't do uh, physical settlement at uh, uh, Norexico. You don't get or or you don't get the goods. Uh, it's always cash settlement. And what do we settle against? Yes, we have an agreement with Fast Markets Forex and Fast Markets Risi. Um, they are part of the Euro Money Group, and we use their indices for settlement. At the moment, we have two contracts. We have the long fiber, uh, kind of the Nordic um, uh, pulp contract, and we have the short fiber uh, contract. 
typical um, eucalyptus and so on made by by uh, Brazilians and other warmer areas of the world. So we have two pulp contracts today. So the buyer and the seller, they meet at Norexico and then they agree on, on, on the deal. In order to make this work, we also needed to make an agreement with the clearinghouse. And I have to uh, not warn you, but, uh, but uh, alert you that you have to find a good partner when it comes to, to clearing. And uh, unless you want to set up the clearing uh, yourself, you know, a clearing house is really uh, a bank, some kind of a banking license. Um, and, and then uh, having this agreement uh, is, of course, uh, crucial. And uh, the way things work now and the way the, I, I, I would say, the, the, the financial climate is uh, throughout the world, I would say it's it's not a walk in the park for a new enterprise in order to find a good clearinghouse. Uh, because uh, the clearinghouses, they are loaded with uh, with uh, new regulative, uh, regulative uh, uh, claims, uh, and they have a lot of work and attention on existing markets. So we were lucky to find a good clearinghouse open for new uh, new opportunities. So when you have an agreement with the clearinghouse, you also need to involve uh, the clearing banks. And in Norexico's uh, case, we have these six clearing banks at the moment. And the point is that every buyer or seller at the exchange, uh, then I'm talking about the direct trading members at Norexico, they need to open a, an account with the clearing banks. And we see that when you board a new trading member, a direct trading member at Norexico, it's quite, quite, quite time consuming to get this agreement with the clearing bank. It often takes up to six months if you don't have a, a relationship with one of the banks um, uh, before, in beforehand you know, the KYC processes and so on. So if you would like to have an access to Norexico as an exchange directly, then you would need to be what you call a non-clearing member at the European Commodity Clearing. And you need to have an account with the clearing bank. And the clearing bank is then the clearing member at ECC. That is the construction. If you don't see that you would like to be a direct member on the exchange, but you still would like to access the market, then you can open an account with um, one of the future brokers that are involved at Norexico. So there is an indirect route that for smaller companies or mid-sized companies uh, may be a bit easier. And in our case, uh, there is these four uh, financial institutions uh, that can give you access to, to Norexico if you're not a direct member. Yeah. And then, uh, so we took from 2012-13 till 2016 until we had the first transaction. I think it was in uh, April or May 2016, we had the first transaction at uh, Norexico. Um, and then uh, during the period of 2017 and 2019, you could see that this works. It works perfectly. The setup is good. The ID is good. But we felt that we lacked the necessary uh, support. And then I come to the crucial point, because, I mean, the ID can be as good uh, as a million dollars, but it doesn't help if you don't have support from the industry. So we need to have some strong supporters. And I believe that if I should do this again, I would start out by making sure that I have this support at an earlier stage. On the other hand, uh, if I did that, I don't know if we ever would have got started. So, you know, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem because sometimes you, when you talk to the industry, 
they say, yeah, this is really a good idea. Okay, and I say, okay, that sounds good. We would like to sign in then. Now, yes, of course, we would like to sign in, but we'll, we'll wait and see when you have liquidity. When you have liquidity, we will participate. And then I say, well, if everyone says that, we will never get there. You know that. Yes, we know that, but uh, we, we, we don't have the resource, resources to, 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 to go in front. So this is really the frustrating part of building a market. It's the chicken and egg situation because, I mean, every competent person will say that it's a good idea to manage price risk. And nobody would say, no thanks, I would not like to be able to manage my price risk. But that's quite different from being willing to build this market, to be committed to add liquidity in order to make the market. Because all we can do as an exchange is kind of to, to set the table. We set the table and then the guests have to join in in order to make the fun and make the party lively. So, so this is kind of the challenge I, I, I see right now and, and the challenge that we are still experiencing. So um, uh, when, when, when we got to this stage, we also saw that we had this uh, limited amount of members that got, uh, had Noresco available through the electronic trading systems. But most parts of the industry that were not members, they kind of felt that Norexico was a black hole. You, you, you didn't see it. I mean, transparency is, is the only truth the thing that we are, are, are living for. That, that, that's the idea behind it all. And, and the experience that most people thought, well, Norexico, we heard about it. It's a good idea, but we don't kind of see it and we don't feel it. So what we did then is that we made an, uh, an agreement with uh, Refinitiv, uh, Thomson Reuters. Uh, so Norexico prices uh, are available uh, for, for most people now, uh, if they would like to have it. And, and during the last uh, months, we have also launched a mobile app uh, where you can download the Norexico prices and transactions. So please do if you would like to, to, to watch. Um, and this makes it, of course, more available for, for most people. You can not do transactions on this mobile app, but you can, uh, can, can view, uh, view the prices. So what now then? Uh, we are still in the phase that we are building liquidity. We have these two products, uh, the short fiber and the long fiber uh, pulp products, but we would like to move on and, and we, we feel that we have to, in order to reach our goals, which is the world leading pulp and paper exchange, we need to, uh, we need to expand. So we have decided to, to launch uh, some new products during uh, Q4 2020. Um, first of all, we are going to launch uh, two, two uh, Chinese uh, uh, pulp uh, products. You know, China um, has about one third of the world demand of uh, pulp, and uh, we have a feeling that uh, these two indices are better for us uh, than the indices we have. At least they will uh, supplement uh, what we have today. And we will also list then a recycled uh, paper contract. It will be done uh, uh, sometimes during Q4 uh, as well. Then we are kind of in, in, in your line of, uh, of work. This is a European contract. It's uh, the PIX OCC corrugated container 104. Um, it's a fast markets uh, forex uh, contract. Uh, and I did visit some um, U.S. Um, collectors uh, a couple of years ago and uh, asked them if they would do hedging against the European um, uh, recycled contract. And uh, the message was that uh, the markets are too far away from each other and price movements are not uh, above the levels that you would have to see in order to, to to do hedging. So we considered doing a US contract, 
uh, as well, but uh, we thought we should start out by the uh, with the with the European contract. So we are really excited about it. Uh, what I didn't say previously is that uh, in order to involve the industry, we have uh, now established uh, two what we call product development groups. It's really expert groups. It's one expert group for pulp, and it's one expert group from for recycled paper. Uh, and we have this first recycled paper expert group meeting now in uh, in uh, in August, and we are glad to see that the industry now is uh, willing to and would like to involve themselves in this. So so that's uh, that that's uh, nice. I thought I should use just a couple of minutes in order to to play a, a video. Uh, is that okay? Sure, if you want, or we can we can send it to everyone who signed up for the event too. If you think that's easier, we could just email it to them. Yeah, you can. That, that that's okay with me, or you can or you can uh, watch it on our website. It's really yeah, we can do that. So okay. that, that's really what I what I was going to present, and I'll, I am of course open for uh, for any question. All right, great. Uh... Thank you so much, Sunola. Any any questions from our panelists or audience about uh, the presentation so far? I had I had some. Uh, maybe you can discuss. Do you have any sense of who is actually trading on your platform and and how active they are? That type of thing at this point. You know. Um, uh... We we know everybody that is uh, that is trading, of course, because uh, that's something that we see as an exchange. Uh, it's been it's been hedging among the industry. It's the paper makers and the pulp producers, and um, and even though we would like to see more liquidity, um, we are quite comfortable with the number of uh, companies that now are in the boarding process into Norexico. So, so we see that uh, liquidity is going to expand. Yeah, um, I guess along the same lines, another question I had was, you set up Norexico to be traded kind of throughout Europe, uh, not just Norway. How, how, to what extent has that happened? Is it mostly Nordic producers, or has it really become kind of a, a European thing? No, uh, it's. It, I mean, we 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 don't have any members from Norway, uh, so so that's the question on that. Uh, the answer on that question, but I would say it's USA, it's uh, Southern Europe, it's uh, Northern Europe. Uh, we see now we have been working very uh, thoroughly uh, during the last period in order to make this open for for Asian uh, clients as well. So some uh, Asian clients are boarding from uh, from Singapore. Uh, so it's really throughout the world, and we are really working hard with the, the South Americans. And we hope that we within a month or two will have. Uh, Two South American uh, large uh, companies in on the platform. Okay, that's great. Other questions from our panelists? Philip, you got one? I have. I have. I'm just sorry, blundering around. There's a little question in the chat as well, which is probably worth picking up quite soon. Which is what? What is pulp? So, <laughs> I'm sorry. We could we could answer yeah, that. But... Pulp, uh, pulp is uh, when 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 you go into the forest, you have to cut down the tree, and then you chop it up into to wood chip, and then you have a process in order to make this fiber into material for making paper and other products made out of paper. So pulp is actually the ingredient that they're using in order to make tissue, newspaper, graphic paper, and so on. So that's great, but that wasn't my question. That was just a, a question from, from the floor. Um, my, so the, the, I mean, it was a really fascinating presentation, and thank you very much, and a, a really fascinating project. But this issue of the chicken and egg of liquidity that you, you described, this is, this is like the, this is the existential question for a new 
exchange, isn't it? And you must have given it a lot of thought. Um, and I wonder what, um, so you talked about new products, but I wonder what kind of other possibilities you've, 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 you've thought about or experimented with in terms of, of just getting, getting that going. Uh, you you are completely right. I mean, the, the only crucial thing right now is to to, to attract liquidity. And and we, we say in our business, in our line of business, that uh, liquidity adds liquidity. Uh, so it's kind of a, uh, what do you call it, uh, as a self-building issue. When you get uh, liquidity, you will attract other participants. So... This is something that we are thinking about from 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 morning till uh, till uh, till dawn, and and what 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 can you do about it? What we can do about it is to work uh, with a long term perspective, and of course we also work with in a short term perspective in order to show the market where the market is. But in the long term perspective, I think it's important that we work on education. We work on different strategies in order to hedge out unwanted risks. So we have seminars, we do meetings, we hold presentations, and we really work together with the industry in order to make uh, an increased understanding of risk. And if you if you do the same as we did, you kind of enter with this new opportunity into a new industry or into an existing industry then you have to be patient. You have to work together with the industry and you have to really uh, take this education part of it very seriously. And the funny thing is that when you start talking to the industry and you start talking to people, first you probably will meet people that don't know how derivatives actually work. You talk to the ones sitting on, on sourcing or, or selling the product who is actually working on the physical side. And the physical guys, they often feel kind of intimidated by this. They say, okay, so these financial guys are going to take our, our kind of important role uh, in, in the company. That is, of course, completely wrong. Because the physical guys, they're going to work just as they used to do previously. This is a risk management tool for the treasury department. So it's really important to, 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 to make this understanding within the industry. So we, we, but I must say, uh, we could have done this differently. We could have done it better, uh, but we have learned a lot. So now we know where to go, how to do it, and, and who to talk to. Gene, that's such an interesting point, because the waste, the waste industry, I think, would feel a lot of the same way about people that are in operations or dealing with the physical product feeling as though like the, the finance side is gonna come and sort of push them out of business or otherwise, you know, modify how they do business. Um, there's some really great questions, some that were in the Q&A and some that were sent directly to me. Um, Brian, who's at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission in the US asked me, to what extent did Norexico consider using indications of interest, like non-binding bids and offers as a first step to build of the market and help demonstrate liquidity. Hmm. Um, we we have an opportunity in our uh, in our uh, trading system uh, that is called request for quote. Uh, that means that you are kind of showing your interest, but it's not binding. Um, I don't know if that is what the one asking the question is asking for. But we have not considered doing that as kind of a main activity in order to build the market. But uh, when you are building a market like we are, you are, of course, you would like to have everything on screen and you would like to have the trading system as the one that everything is, everyone is looking at. But in fact, the actual and actually, we are using a lot of work on the phone. And, and you know, at the beginning, when you're building a market, you have you have uh, you have to talk to the market participants, and then you get indicative interest. You get indicative in interest on the phone, and then as soon as you manage to firm it up, then you have to put it on screen. So when our uh, desk manager when he has a firm order, it has to go on screen immediately. He cannot sit on a firm order without putting it on screen. Then it's only indicative. 
Okay. Yeah, I think the I think that was like the question to figure out. Can you demonstrate liquidity from people who aren't actually necessarily going to make a trade? You know, a trade is not imminent, but they just want to find out about prices or whatever's out there. I think was the, the question. Um, another really interesting question from Kathy, who is a, a recycling, a former recycling professional here in New Jersey. Um, could you explain more what you mean when you said that the exchange works, but it lacks support from the industry? What kind of support do you think is missing? I think this outspoken support that someone is willing to, some big industry leader is going to uh, willing to stand up uh, in a seminar and say, it's really important that we get a transparent and liquid uh, futures market in order to unload our risks. And we are willing to step ahead and, 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 uh, and take a lead on that. Uh, you, you need to have some from the industry that are outspoken sponsors of the idea. What, what's been the, I guess, as a follow up, what has been the response from the paper and pulp industry when you've approached them about using Norexico? You know, I guess in an ideal world, this would be the main way that transactions are arranged. That would be your ideal outcome. What are their reservations for, for using the platform or? Uh, why are they hesitant, or why do companies eventually join up? Mm. I, I, that that question is is really a good question, and I, I have to be careful not to step on any toes now, because uh, I think everyone I talk to eye to eye, and and I mean actually everyone, are more or less positive uh, because the, of the idea and the concept. But I believe that maybe some of the big ones may have a um, crossing interest. They will not tell it to you. They will not tell it to your face. But you know, you are getting a transparent market. Everyone sits with the same information. Everyone can see the prices. And where are you today? You are in an environment where everyone thinks that they are going to do a better deal than the competitor. So, of course, the big ones in, in, in a market that is not transparent can use their weight to get better conditions. So, uh, of course, uh, I, I think if you, if you have probably studied other commodity markets and you see that the large market participants are not the ones that are kind of the largest, I mean, the very largest, are not the ones that are uh, initiating this. It's the level a little below. And I think we see that as well at Norexico. There may be, and I'm not, I'm not saying there is, but there may be some hesitance among the very biggest. It's really interesting, because I think there's a similar market structure for for the waste industry that's evolving in the US. It's, you know, four firms control 50 or 60% of all the recyclables collected at this point. So there's a similar kind of structure happening. Um, other questions from our panelists before we end our first uh, session of the morning? Yeah, Jordan. Uh, hi, Stanley. I really enjoyed your uh, presentation. And uh, I have a question about uh, figuring out how to improve liquidity. Uh, one recent innovation in US markets was exchanges and off exchange facilities instituted a sort of uh, rebate system where uh, instead of when a trade occurs, both parties, let's say, pay uh, five cents a contract, uh, the liquidity provider uh, instead would say, you know, receive a rebate of 10 cents uh, a contract. The, the liquidity taker would pay 20 cents a contract. So from the standpoint of the exchange, they'd still take in uh, the same amount of commissions every time there's a trade, but that had the effect of uh, improving liquidity by getting um, incentivizing market makers and other uh, participants to be the person who uh, initially puts a, a real uh, a limit executable order on the book. Uh, first, so is that something you've uh, considered at all for uh, Norexco? Yes, uh, it is. Uh, the 
the sorry thing about this is that uh, uh, if, if you go if you go five and ten years back, it was more common making market maker agreements uh, from exchanges to to market participants. And the thing now is that market maker agreements, where you are committed uh, to to put prices on screen, maybe put a spread on screen, um, it's really uh, because of reg regulatory. Uh, uh, commitments. Uh, it's harder now to make those agreements than it used to be because it requires capital on the one that is uh, holding this uh, responsibility. Uh, but that, and, and, and we feel that, I mean, we have tried to, to get market maker agreements and we haven't succeeded. Uh, and we will still go after it. But uh, when I say that we have tried it and we haven't succeeded, uh, that is a little warning that it's 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 hard to get it, and and I, I am willing to, to to pay. I'm willing to pay. I mean, I'm really willing to pay in order to have one putting prices regularly on the screen, and that he's committed to do it. I would say that today we have some liquidity providers, and the difference between a liquidity provider, as you probably know, and a market maker is that the liquidity liquidity provider he is he is. We kind of have a deal that he's providing liquidity, but he also has the right to not do it. So uh, I think uh, today's climate with the, the regulator, uh, regulatory uh, burden, I think it's easier to get uh, liquidity providers than market makers. Um. That's really interesting, and uh, I think a related question. Our last question for our first session is from uh, Joseph Ferranti, who's an attorney who's been active in the waste management industry here in New Jersey. Um, do you think it would be helpful if, like, procurement regulations or other regulations required that bidders were participants in your exchange? Like, if there were some sort of regulatory requirement that um, I guess required people to be direct members of the exchange versus going through banks or going through these other intermediaries that you described. Um, yes, of course. I would love if there was a, re a regulatory requirement. That would be really uh, neat. But um, uh, I would say uh, let, let, let's let's think of it this way: when you sit in a large company. Uh, and, 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 you, and you are a board member of a large company. I believe there are requirements uh, on the board side that they are managing the risks in a in 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 a um, uh, decent way, in a, in a in a good way. And and managing risks that means that you have a risk policy in place. That means that you uh, when you have a risk policy, you have to touch upon all different kinds of risks. And, and you then have to have a mandate out to the one that are going to e execute on that risk policy. And I believe that there are a regulative uh, commitment for a board member in order to set out the, the risk strategy of the company and make sure that it's uh, within, uh, that the risk is performed within the strategy. Um, uh, the funny thing is that uh, when, when uh, uh, both European and American uh, regulators, they would actually like to see that uh, financial contracts are moved from the uh, or, or are moved into a regular regulated marketplace from the OTC market and into a regulated marketplace. The funny thing. Uh, are you still hearing me? Yeah, yeah, we can still see you. Yeah, okay. Uh, they have ma made regulations that are so heavy that they are kind of working against the idea of participating in a market, which kind of is um, uh, what you call it. It's, it's a dilemma. On one hand, you would like to have it. On the other hand, you have uh, you have constructions that kind of prevent it. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's so many questions and it's interesting. I think the closing note 
from this first session is that it's everyone who will hear the idea will agree that it's a, a worthwhile concept, but it's so difficult to get the firms that would trade to actually take the first steps and commit liquidity and, and all the other things that that you mentioned. So I think you've left us with a lot to think about for our project and for everyone who is listening this morning or this afternoon where you are seeing Ola. So thank you so much for joining us and telling us about uh, Norexico. We're all clapping for you. <laughs> You know, from a distance. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, we hope that you'll stick around for our, our other sessions if you're able, and and you know, add what you've learned. Um, we're a few minutes behind our schedule for the morning. Um, I'm going to turn over, being the moderator, to to the other Jordan, Jordan Moore, who uh, is going to take us into our next session. Are you ready, Jordan? I'm ready. Okay, and, and Daniel as well, and uh, in our, our middle session here, we'll also hear from Michael Ergong. Just um, as a reminder to everyone who's an attendee, um, the best thing to do to get your question to the panelists is to use the, the box that says Q&A. Some of you sent me messages via email or uh, directly through the, the chat feature. If you type in the Q&A box, everyone who's participating can see the question. Uh, just so, you know, if, if whoever is relaying it misses something or, or whatever. So if you could please use the Q&A box for your questions, just whenever you feel like it, it doesn't have to be at, at any particular time. Uh, I think that'll help us kind of keep everything moving along. So I'll turn it over to Jordan and Daniel and Michael. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Jordan Moore. I am uh, now the presenter. Great. And uh, I am an assistant professor of finance at Rowan University. So Jordan Howell, myself, and uh, my colleague, Daniel Falkenstein, who's also a finance professor at Rowan, uh, spearheaded this uh, research project. We appreciate uh, everyone joining us today. And uh, in the second session, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, just how uh, futures markets work in general. Uh, so, uh, Daniel and I are going to give a brief presentation uh, about just basics of future contracts so that hopefully uh, the audience is all sort of uh, knows what we're talking about using the same terminology. Uh, and then after our presentation, we'll be introducing uh, our featured uh, speaker of the hour, Michael Ergang, who has uh, a lot of experience actually using futures contracts and other derivatives for uh, risk management purposes for major companies. So uh, I'm going to take a moment and try to uh, figure out how to share uh, the presentation. Hopefully it'll be pretty uh, straightforward. You never know the technology, uh, but let me see if I can uh, grab this. Okay, so you can see the uh, presentation. Done it, success. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so again, uh, my colleague, uh, Daniel Folk, she and I will be talking a little bit about uh, just very basics of uh, futures contracts. For some of you, this will really be uh, review material. Uh, but ideally in our project, we wanna show that uh, if we introduce futures contracts in uh, recyclable products, uh, as they've done in uh, Norexico uh, with the pulp and paper products, that there uh, will be some overall advantage to uh, the marketplace. Uh, so I want to begin by just talking about uh, real basics about what a futures contract is. Uh, so a futures contract is what we call a, a derivative and uh, futures contracts and options are the most common uh, derivative contracts, although there are a number of other types of uh, contracts. But uh, the main features are that there's a buyer and a seller uh, of a futures contract, and uh, there's a number of specific features of the contract. Namely, uh, what is the underlying asset uh, that we're talking about, whether it's uh, a particular commodity, a uh, single stock, perhaps an index of stocks. Uh, what is the quantity that corresponds to each contract? So are we talking about exchanging, you know, 10 barrels of oil or 100 barrels of oil? Uh, each contract has a uh, specific uh, price associated with it. So the two parties agree that they will trade uh, the quantity of the underlying asset at a specific price. Uh, and then there's a specific date, which is sometimes called the uh, expiration date uh, or the termination date of the contract. 
So one key uh, difference between futures and options contracts is that uh, the buyer and seller of the futures contracts both agree to this transaction. So both parties agree uh, that they're going to exchange oil at you know, $100 a barrel or $150 a barrel uh, at some point in the future. Uh, now, obviously, when that date in the future comes, uh, one party is probably going to be happy that they made the deal. One party is going to be unhappy that they made the deal uh, based upon what the price uh, of the asset is at that point in the future. Uh, but both parties agree that they will exchange uh, that underlying asset at that particular point in the future at the agreed upon price. Uh, so why do we call this a derivative? Uh, a derivative is something where the price of the contract is going to be closely related to the price of the underlying asset. Uh, and the idea is that since both parties agree to exchange some asset in the future, uh, they're probably not going to agree to a price that's vastly different than the current price. So if some particular stock is trading at $100 and we're talking about uh, you know, exchanging this asset three months in the future, you're probably not going to get anyone who's going to be willing to pay a thousand dollars in three months. You're probably not going to be able to get anyone who's willing to sell the asset for ten dollars in three months. So the price is going to be somewhat related to the price that the asset is currently trading. Uh, in terms of uh, advantages and disadvantages to these contracts, uh, the advantage is that both parties, whether you're the buyer or seller, we'll give you an example in a minute, uh, can find it helpful to hedge or to lock in what price they're going to be dealing with uh, in the future. So this, in a sense, reduces uh, price volatility. And because of that, uh, we hypothesize that if we introduce uh, these contracts in recycled products, that both the buyers and sellers of these products will find it more feasible to make longer term uh, investments because they have more price certainty. Uh, they'll be willing to employ more workers associated with that investment. And obviously, there will be advantages to the environment as well, because you'll have a more robust uh, market for these recycled materials. Now, that said, uh, futures are not, you know, uh, necessarily inherently a good thing. They could be dangerous in the sense that you have parties who are able to simply speculate uh, on whether the prices are going to be going up or down uh, and potentially take advantage of uh, the leverage aspect of futures. Uh, to increase the volatility in whatever the underlying product is. Uh, so our hope is to show that by uh, in this research project that to show if we introduce one of these uh, futures contracts for various recycled products that we're more likely to get uh, overall benefits in terms of uh, hedging than, uh, than the disadvantages. So let me just give a brief example of uh, how you could use futures to hedge. So let's say you have uh, uh, two farmers, you have a corn farmer, uh, and a corn farmer is worried, uh, has already has some corn in the ground, is worried that uh, the price is gonna go down. If the price is gonna go down, uh, the corn farmer already made the investment, and so this is pure risk for uh, the corn farmer. Uh, on the other hand, you have a, uh, let's say, a, a cattle farmer, and for the cattle farmer, uh, corn is uh, an expense rather than a source of revenue. Uh, so for the cattle farmer, uh, farmer Alice here is worried that the price of corn is going to go up, making it more expensive for her to buy corn uh, and feed her cattle, eating into her profits. So both parties uh, have, you know, one way that corn prices can go that's good for them, one way that's bad for them. Uh, and so uh, they can mutually agree to exchange futures, uh, and in real life, Bob and Alice are most likely not gonna be trading directly with each other, they'll be trading via some exchange. Uh, but they'll both essentially lock in their future price that they'll be getting or receiving for corn, and uh, this is going to be something that uh, is beneficial to both parties in, in an ideal world. Uh, so um, just to build on a, a point that uh, Spinole made, that uh, maybe some people uh, overlooked is this idea of, of what he calls cash settlement. And so the way the Norexico uh, exchange works is that uh, when the contract expires, rather than uh, one party actually being responsible for delivering uh, a big load of uh, pulp or paper product to another uh, party, the idea is that the parties aren't going to actually exchange uh, the underlying security. If they did that, it would be what's called 
physical items, but in fact, what they're just going to do is exchange, uh, is basically settle the profit and loss of the transaction. Uh, so if uh, the corn prices are 330 uh, cents per bushel, uh, when the two parties in this scenario initiate their contract, uh, when the, uh, let's say then, the contract expires and uh, corn is now 400 cents a bushel. Uh, basically, the two parties, Alice and Bob, don't actually need to exchange uh, corn with each other. They could both be exchanging corn with whatever intermediaries they normally deal with. Uh, but the profit or loss from the futures transaction is going to exactly offset uh, the uh, profit or loss that the two parties experience from a movement in the price of corn from when the contract was initiated to when the contract expired. Uh, and so one thing we'll be trying to get an idea of over the course of this project is if we were to set up one of these exchanges, would this want, would these contracts be uh, cash settled uh, as Norexco is doing, uh, or would we, would we want these contracts to be physically settled for some reason? In other words, uh, the long party and the short party at expiration would actually be uh, exchanging, you know, tons of uh, of recycled plastic bottles or whatever the the underlying security is. Uh, okay, so at this point, I'm going to turn over the uh, talking to uh, my colleague Daniel Falkenstein, who will give uh, a little bit more of an insight about uh, how we would use futures. Okay, uh, so uh, let's uh, um, build on this cash settlement idea, right? Um, and look at how these contracts thereby may be uh, used by a speculator. Uh, so let's uh, go on to the next slide here. I would have an example of uh, um, somebody who is just a trader who wants uh, to profit from uh, his expectation of a change in commodity price, right? Uh, so Trader Joe here in our example, uh, he's not interested in, in actually receiving a bunch of wheat or selling a bunch of wheat. He's not interested in buying a bunch and storing it for a while. He just wants to make a profit if his expectation of future price movements in the commodity is correct. Right, so using cash settled futures uh, will allow, allow the trader to do just that without having to actually touch any physical wheat or whatever commodity, right? So in our example of Joe expects that prices of wheat are going to go up, he can go to the futures market and uh, get into a long futures position, which means he's agreeing to buy wheat at whatever the price is uh, today or close to. And then if uh, wheat prices go up in the next few months, then uh, he gets a uh, cash settlement at uh, contract expiration and takes his profit without actually having to touch any wheat. You can imagine that if futures contracts did not exist, um, then he would have to buy a bunch of actual wheat and find a warehouse to store it for a while before he can later on take it out and sell it at a profit, right? So by having these uh, financial derivative contracts, uh, it allows, uh, people to incorporate their expectations into the market price of the commodity without having to have the infrastructure and the ability to deal with actual bunch of physical stuff, right? And it also allows uh, the expectations on the downside of the price to be incorporated symmetrically, right? If you are a uh, trader and you want to, uh, uh, and you anticipate the price is gonna go down, right? you can just agree to sell wheat in the futures market, right? And allow you to profit if you're correct. So uh, uh, that's uh, the basic idea, right? The, the futures contract doesn't care whether you are a hedger and you have some underlying interest in the commodity, right? You look like you're a farmer or something, or if you're just a speculator and you have an expectation of a futures price movement. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that the speculator is not a bad party here. Right, the presence of speculators in the market introduces more liquidity into the futures market and allows hedgers to trade against the speculators. Right, so essentially the speculators will take some of the risk of the price movements away from the hedgers 
by entering the other side of the contract, right? Uh, so uh, uh, for any market, there always have to be two parties who have opposite expectations. Every time you buy the share of Tesla, for example, right, you're buying it from somebody who thought it's a good time to sell, right? So the same thing in the uh, commodities markets, right? Every time you think it's a good time to buy, you have to find somebody who thinks it's a great time to sell, right? And so the speculators introduce this extra liquidity uh, into the market and allow any uh, actual participants uh, in the commodities market to hedge their uh, positions with relatively little friction uh, as a result of there being present a bunch of speculators who are willing to trade. Uh, so uh, let's uh, go on to the next slide for a second and uh, see how this would apply specifically to the recycled materials example. Right. Uh, when we're talking about uh, recycled products, right, there are as well both producers and consumers uh, of this uh, commodity. Uh, for example, here we have a recycling plant that is going to sort and clean a bunch of plastic PET bottles, right? And they're expecting to take this final product that they produce from the recycled materials and to sell them on to somebody who is a manufacturer who uses it as an input, right? So just as in the wheat farming or corn farming example that we had a few slides ago, it's the same thing. We have somebody who is expecting to produce X tons of PET plastic and is wondering, I wonder if I'll be able to sell this stuff when I have it in a few months. And then we also have a consumer of that commodity uh, who is manufacturing stuff and he is wondering, I wonder if I'll be able to buy it at a good price when I need more of it to make the uh, final product. Right, and so both of these uh, parties would benefit from locking in a price in the future uh, in the futures market, uh, so that they can eliminate this kind of price uncertainty that exists. Um, and as we saw, as I know they look uh, er, uh, show earlier that uh, slide with the volatility in the prices of recycled paper. Right, there can be a lot of volatility in the prices of these uh, commodity inputs. And so if you are a uh, you know, participant in the actual manufacturing of something from recycled materials, and there is such a large price uncertainty of how much it will cost you, you might be having second thoughts about expanding your production capacity. Because I don't know if next year it will still be profitable to do this, you know, to produce this thing I'm producing. So with the existence of the futures market, this allows or would hypothetically allow the uh, manufacturer in the recycled, uh, uh, recycled supply chain to lock in some prices for some number of years in the future and then have a more certainty in uh, being able to invest in expanding capacity or new manufacturing lines or things like that. Um, so. Um, if we go on to the next slide and uh, uh, look at some overall uh, evidence of uh, what people have observed from other derivatives markets, right, as uh, my colleague Jordan just mentioned, that it is possible not only that derivatives market will be good for the, uh, the hedgers who are participating in it, but also it is possible that if there is a predominance of speculators in the market, they could increase the volatility, right, because as everybody rushes into the market to try to speculate on price going up or down, it might actually exacerbate the swings in the price of the asset. Uh, so there is uh, quite a bit of uh, academic literature out there uh, that looks at both uh, commodity futures, such as oil and corn, as well as uh, futures and options on individual stocks or stock indices, and analyzes how the market has changed after the introduction of these derivative products in the market. Right. Uh, and in general, there seems to be a consensus in the finding across a bunch of markets that uh, futures uh, and other derivatives, uh, when introduced uh, into a market, will lower volatility, increase market depth, and increase trading volumes, uh, which reduces trading costs and bid ask spreads. So in general, it seems like introducing uh, financial derivatives into a market has a beneficial effect on the quality of that market. Uh, so um, unless something unusual happens uh, in the recycled industry that is very different from everywhere else that we've seen, uh, it should uh, basically uh, have a beneficial effect on market quality and liquidity, which should benefit 
the actual participants in the supply chain uh, of recycled material. And here at the bottom of the slide, we have some representative uh, uh, references and citations uh, to some papers that uh, analyze uh, uh, this situation. So uh, this is kind of a, a brief summary of how futures contracts work and how futures markets operate in general, just to make sure that uh, all of our uh, uh, attendees here are on the same page. Uh, so if anybody has any uh, questions uh, to uh, either me or uh, Jordan, uh, just feel free to uh, throw them out into the Q&A. Anything else you would like to add, Jordan? Have I uh, covered everything okay? Yes, uh, I think that sounds good. And uh, at this point, uh, actually, let me try to stop sharing this uh, uh, presentation. At this point, I would like to uh, introduce our uh, featured speaker of the session. Uh, and uh, Daniel and I are both uh, on the academic side, giving you some sort of theory, how things are going to work. Uh, we're going to introduce uh, someone with uh, Michael Ergang, who has extensive uh, experience managing commodity price risk for uh, a variety of companies. Uh, he worked for uh, over 20 years for McDonald's, was responsible for uh, developing and leading uh, their program on uh, commodities risk management. You can imagine uh, a firm like McDonald's that tries to keep uh, prices the same uh, over time uh, is going to have some very complex uh, strategies for uh, managing their exposure to uh, changing commodity prices. Uh, he's also responsible for developing and leading uh, the global foreign exchange uh, strategy for McDonald's as well. Uh, for the last four years, Michael's worked uh, as uh, president and owner of Global Risk Management Inc., which is a consultant in uh, commodities risk management, working for a variety of different types of firms. Uh, previously, Michael holds an MBA from University of Chicago with specialties in financial management and international business management. Uh, and we look forward to hearing how in the real world, uh, companies who uh, have this type of uh, price risk exposure, uh, think about that in terms of using futures contracts for uh, hedging purposes. So uh, I'll turn it over to you, Michael, and uh, we're very happy to have you. Uh, thank you, Professor Moore, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I certainly appreciate the introduction and, and uh, it's a pleasure to speak on uh, and be part of this conference. Um, is in terms of uh, the use of derivatives right now, I, uh, as Jordan mentioned, I, uh, I work in a consulting firm where we work with companies uh, from farm to fork. So we, you know, we have clients like, uh, like uh, farmer Alice, who one is wants to maximize the value of the row crop. Uh, we have clients that uh, put food on trays to serve customers um, and everyone in between, whether it's food manufacturing or food service distribution. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about how a company like uh, like McDonald's uh, work uh, uses derivatives, because I think it would uh, the, the genesis over a period of time, I think, plays into uh, a lot of the issues that you guys are facing in developing a derivative market for recyclables. So let me just start out by saying, what, why would a company like McDonald's uh, use derivatives? I mean, we're we, we were a hamburger company, right? Um, well, let me. There's a couple things. First of all, McDonald's does business in 100 in 119 countries. And as a retailer, you have to charge in local currency for your product, right? So if you're in, if you're buying hamburgers in Uruguay, you're going to pay in pesos, uh, Malaysia, it's ringgits and what have you. Um, yet our, our dividends that we pay our shareholders are in US dollars. And when we would buy back our, our stock, uh, we would the cost would be in U.S. dollars. A lot of our expenses are U, in U.S. dollars. So what would happen in any one month, quarter, or year if the value of the U.S. dollar strengthens so much that the foreign currencies that we're getting from all around the world don't generate enough U.S. dollars to meet our needs? And the answer uh, the answer is derivatives. And um, so uh, Professor Moore talked specifically about corn. Uh, the use of uh, corn futures, well, what we would do is we would use a combination of futures when, such as in the Mexican peso, when there was a futures market available, but we would also, you might say, forward sell uh, 
currencies around the world using uh, over-the-counter derivatives with directly with banks. And there's advantages and disadvantages of the two, which I'll, I'll get get into a little bit. Um, but but it, uh, but a good part of being able to manage our cash flow and our financial requirements was being able to manage the foreign currency risk, particularly as the as the growth of the company became more international versus uh, versus domestic. So the, the the percentage of our overall revenue began to increase. Now there's another way that a reason we would use derivatives, and that has to do on the on the financing side. So. So companies like McDonald's borrow money uh, regularly just to, you know, for normal working capital needs. Um, sometimes what happens is uh, the demand for McDonald's bonds might be really, really strong in a country like South Africa, where they don't have a lot of uh, corporate bonds that they could invest in. So they might be willing to accept a lower interest rate on a, on a corporate bond uh, issued by McDonald's. Um, but McDonald's might not actually need South African rand. We might need euros or yen or, or US dollars. What the derivatives market allows us to do is it allows us to essentially convert an obligation denominated in South African rand to, to US dollars. So essentially we can convert a, a South African rand financing to a US dollar financing for, through the use of over-the-counter over derivatives markets or what's called a currency swaps. Okay. Now, what I've talked about so far is really financial engineering. And at this point, it doesn't really matter, quite frankly, if McDonald's sells hamburgers or steamrollers. It's really the, the cash flows and the financing part. But so I this was really my first job at McDonald's was really on the financing side, uh, managing the currency risk and the liquidity risk. Um, so anyway, in uh, maybe four or five years into my job, around 1997, I had lunch with a few people in, in our procurement team, and uh, you know, just a, you know, a nice chatter. And one of the things that they happened to mention is that uh, as an organization, they really love promoting bacon sandwiches. Uh, they make great promotional items, uh, li what we call limited time only or LTOs. Uh, the problem that they said is that whenever they would uh, they would tell the franchisees about a that. Uh, they would propose a, a promotion to the franchisees, but as soon as they it was announced to the world that they were promoting bacon, the price would go up significantly. Now, those of you students in the audience that have studied the efficient market theory, I can assure you firsthand that isn't just a bunch of academic mumbo jumbo. That really happens, and it happens really quickly. So at the time, I didn't really know much about limited time promotions, and I certainly didn't know much about uh, pork bellies, which are used to make bacon, but I threw out the the the, the hypothetical. Said, well, what if we locked them to the price of pork bellies before the whole world knew that we were going to be promoting bacon? And they all looked at me and said, "Can we do that?" And I said, "Well, let's give it a try and let's give it a try and see what happens." So we went ahead and did that, and we we came up with a there was a promotion, and we made a commitment to the franchisees that the price of bacon would not exceed a certain level during the entire time of the promotion and it was very well appreciated and it was part and it was the cornerstone of a successful strategy okay so now we're starting to say huh i wonder what else we can do so then at this time we're getting into the early 2000s and for a company in uh, in what's called the qsr the quick service restaurant industry um, the cornerstone of value is what's called everyday low prices you do not want to be surprised as a customer when you go in and you see and you look at the prices on the menu. So one of the one of the strategies that was being floated at the time was the creation of a dollar menu, where there were a series of products on the menu that you could buy for for a dollar. Okay, now let's uh, let's focus a little bit on the on the double cheeseburger, because the for about five years you could go into a McDonald's and and buy a double cheeseburger for $1. Yet the price of beef fluctuates significantly, the price of cheese fluctuates significantly, the flour to make the bun fluctuates significantly, the polypropylene to make the wrapper fluctuates significantly. And what I mean by significantly is as follows. When Mr. Larson showed you a, a, a graph of historical volatility uh, for NBSK, anywhere from 15 to 
25%. Um, anyone want to guess what the volatility of ground beef is? How about 85%? Okay, and if and if you think I'm if you think I'm making that up, um, just this year, uh, the price of ground beef was uh, at, at the wholesale level was fifty dollars a hundred weight in March, and in May it was over three hundred dollars a hundred weight, and now it's back to fifty five dollars a hundred weight. So, so the question to the to the audience is, how do you how can you commit to selling a a double cheeseburger for a dollar? Last five years. When you have all this, you have all this volatility, and uh, you and, and now um, one of the things I also wanted to mention, and because I'm speaking, this is a, an academic forum, is that I wanted to point out the fact that I spoke to the volatility of the components as individual exposures, but but what I really have here is a small is a small portfolio of risks. Think about it that way. So. There's some covariance between beef and flour and cheese and polypropylene and the swath of uh, soybean oil that goes into the ketchup, so forth and so on. So instead of having a, a sum of individual risks, I have a mini portfolio here. Now, Jordan, in my introduction, uh, Jordan mentioned that I went to the University of Chicago and I was a very proud alumni. Uh, in fact, in 1997, when everyone else had a picture of Michael Jordan in their cubicle, I had a picture of Harry Markowitz in my cubicle. Harry Markowitz came up with this really great idea that there's an optimal trade-off between uh, risk and return in a portfolio. Well, I essentially hijacked his theory and said, well, you know what? There's, a, there's an optimal trade-off between risk and cost in this portfolio that we're going to call a double cheeseburger. Now, we could call it a bunch of different things. We could call it an egg McMuffin. It, it, doesn't, really, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the weighting of the volumes um, and the ability to manage, and to be, and the ability to mitigate those risks either through natural covariance or the use of over-the-counter derivatives. Now, so, okay, so how do you hedge the, hedge the components? Okay, beef, we talked about beef, cheese, flour, polypropylene. Um, in the in the 20 minutes, I'm not going to cover every one of them. But interestingly enough, I think cheese is probably the most relevant one to this audience, because back in the in the late 90s, when we started looking at hedging cheese, um, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange had a contract, um, a class three milk futures contract, and that's how cheese is priced off of class three milk um, that had been around for a while. But the open interest of that contract was wasn't a week's use of, worth of cheese usage that McDonald's would use globally. So, so how do you, as a large user, how do you make, uh, how do you leverage the the value or the protect the, the the risk mitigation promise of a futures contract when you're the largest user? One of my teammates uh, made the joke that if we were to try to use the the class three milk futures contract, it would be like trying to stuff a whale a whale into a bathtub. Okay, his joke, not mine. Um, but you know, I, I took a step back and uh, said, "Well, you know, but let's let's ask another question: How do small derivatives markets become deriv big derivatives markets?" And the answer is by big potential users starting out small. So I so what we what we did is we said, "Okay, look, maybe we could only hedge one percent of our cheese usage today, but by being an active participant." participant in the market, that will encourage liquidity, which will grow, which will ultimately hopefully grow the market so that at some point we'll be able to hedge an increasing percentage of our risk. So as an end user, we had to be very forward thinking into, we, we had to shoulder and maybe responsibility is a long word. Opportunity is a, probably a better word. There's opportunity in end users participating in these markets is a way of helping them grow and develop. So is so part and parcel with our ability to hedge cheese and all the other commodities, we were able to uh, effectively develop over time enough liquidity where, where the risk management program, which started out as a, uh, you know, a, a modest amount of pork bellies um, hedge, 
when it uh, grew to a multi-billion dollar strategic global initiative within the industry when I left McDonald's in 2013. Um, and a lot of it, I, you know, I'd like to take responsibility for it, um, but the reality is a lot of it was user-driven. The ability to manage our costs uh, influenced what the company was able to do in the restaurants, and that grew the derivatives market, and that created a competitive advantage within the McDonald's system. Now, let's talk specifically about, uh, uh, about some of the, the requirements uh, for derivatives. Um, in some cases, uh, fortunately, I'm repeating a lot of what's already been said, but, but that's okay. Um, the, number one, the number one issue is liquidity. Um, you have to be able, and some companies have specific risk limits where they will not participate in a market if they are uh, greater than a predetermined percentage of the market. Um, nobody, there, there's certain liquidity issues because whenever you want to enter into a derivative, you want to be able to exit, regardless of your purpose, you want the ability to exit for, um, for it, it without, with minimal costs. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a very important point for end users and it is a, uh, and it's a constraint. It's a, it's a challenge in, in developing derivatives markets. Um, there's one thing that also gets a lot of, it, it doesn't get a lot of focus in academia, but it really does in the real world, and that's counterparty credit risk. That is a close number second. Okay, so the question is, when is a derivative not a derivative? Okay, so what do I mean by counterparty credit risk? So let's say we're looking to hedge uh, the price of beef at a dollar a pound. I'm, I'm just making up numbers. If the, if the price of beef and we've locked in the price of beef at a dollar a pound for the next year. If the price of beef goes to a dollar eighty, um, you know we're we're happy because we we got the price that we wanted. But what if our what if our counterparty disappears? Okay, so now now we got a little bit of a problem. We 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 have a promotion. We've told everyone within our organization. We've told our our, our franchisees, we our, our suppliers, our our investors. That we that we had a certain cash flow expectation, but now all of a sudden, if our counterparty disappears, we're back paying a dollar eighty like everybody else. And I could tell you that, um, and we were we were very concerned about this early on to the point where we would actually simulate uh, the potential counterparty credit risk that we would have, uh, not just by by counterparty in aggregate, and we would have very strict rules as to how much potential credit risk we could have with any one counterparty. Um, those, and I'm, I, I admit I'm aging myself uh, a little bit here, but at one point we were looking at hedging uh, some of our packaging materials. And there was this company that was uh, a really slick new organization out of Houston that was making a market in, uh, in packaging derivatives called Enron. Um, if you haven't heard of them, Google them. It's a, it's a really interesting story. Um, but they had a, they had a fair, they, they had some of the requirements that we met. They had uh, the, they were offering over the counter derivatives on products that were fairly close to the spec that we used in our restaurants. Um, their bid offer spreads were relatively tight. Uh, the issue that we had is that their, their credit rating by standard and poor's was below what our risk policy mandated. Now, Mr. Larson in the first presentations talked about the important set of policies in that companies had, uh, the importance of risk policies in organizations. This is a case in point. The, the exception process was, was very brutal and the Enron at the time did not meet our, our requirements uh, to be a, a derivatives counterparty. So we could not do a derivative in, uh, in spite of the ability to reduce our risk at a fairly reasonable cost. Now, you fast forward maybe 10, 12 months after that point in time, Enron's in bankruptcy. And uh, we, we, had, uh, we had some serious, even though we didn't have any exposure to Enron, we had to answer the tough question, well, why didn't we have a derivative to Enron? And that's, uh, and that's one of the things that we brought up. So counterparty credit risk, um, and this is pre-financial crisis, Pre a lot of disasters that we're familiar with, um, but but counterparty credit risk is something that I uh, I'm, I'm adamant I, I strongly encourage my existing clients to carefully consider they if they don't already, and I strongly 
I work hard to educate the boards of my clients to understand why it's important. Um, so, um, so anyway, you know, in terms of, uh, is I, I'm going to kind of wrap up a little bit. One of the things I wanted to, uh, Professor Howell mentioned at the beginning that was really interesting, the, the importance of, of certainty value. It's, if there's one thing you remember from my presentation, my section is, it's very difficult to, to sell something if you don't know what your, the future cost is gonna be. And Professor Howell mentioned some really good examples. Um, one I, I wanted to uh, hook onto it is let's pretend you're, you're a restaurant company, you're a McDonald's franchisee or any organization and you're looking to borrow money from a bank. The first question the bank is gonna ask you is how are you gonna repay us? What is your cash flow forecast gonna look like? If you don't have any visibility into what your cost structure is, how are you going to answer that? How are you going to answer the next series of difficult questions from the, the bank's lending committee, the credit committee, on how you're going to pay back the loan to get approval? So derivatives play a very important part in financial uh, in, in financial planning, even if you don't even if you don't actually enter into a derivative. The the futures prices provide an unbiased. Uh, look into the future is to for budgeting purposes and where you think the market's going to go. And while it, yes, it's true that futures prices prices are uh, historically have known to be unreliable predictors of the future. The fact is they're unbiased, and for and that carries a lot of weight from a financial planning perspective. Okay, so I've uh, I've rambled on for a, uh, the better part of uh, twenty minutes now. Um, why don't I open up to to questions? Yeah, uh, Jordan, Daniel, I, I've seen some questions come directly my way. I don't know if they made it to you through the Q&A box, too. But um, one of the questions that we got was from Samantha McBride, who, who's a researcher and author and professor on the waste management industry and wrote an excellent book everyone might be interested in called Recycling Reconsidered. And um, she said she's working on a task force that is dealing with uh, recycling and the domestication of processing infrastructure and markets. How could new futures markets be used to promote domestic markets, including building infrastructure capacity in the US? Uh, maybe Michael, the, the one of the sub questions here, or implicit questions here, can you in your experience think of any examples outside of the world of food of ways in which derivatives have been used to like encourage manufacturing or encourage kind of processing infrastructure within the US. So not just the kind of price risk protection type of thing, but other impacts of the derivatives. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question and, and certainly in a, a, a you know one I might have expected to get in this forum. My my experience, quite frankly, is generally it goes it goes the other way. I'm a I'm a manufacturer and I, I'm going to I'm going to manufacture this anyway. Um, what could I do? How could I better? How could I better manage my my costs? Um, that being said, I think that um, I, I could certainly see that it would be healthy uh, to 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 turn that process on its ears or, or reverse that process and say, okay, in the development of a of a recyclable market in the US, the the promise of a derivatives market um, is is uh, is very attractive. And I'm just putting on my buyer's hat is a, is a very attractive opportunity because the first question that people are going to have and users are going to have. That's great. You know, we, we've got a social responsibility scorecard. We'd love to add to it. Um, we've got a we've got shareholders. We have to keep happy. That's true, too. But I think that um, I, I think that the, pro the the overall project is extremely complementary uh, to the growth of the market because it, it's an added promise. Much like the the bacon example, the pork belly bacon example I gave for a, a, a promotion. But at the end of the day, there there has to be the demand first, and I, I think that that's uh, I think that's the reality of the situation. There has to be the demand in order to have the derivatives market. Okay, that's great. Um, other questions for Jordan, Daniel, other panelists? 
there was a question uh, from uh, um, somebody about the RGGI uh, CO2 emissions uh, trading. Uh, let me just pull that up on the Q&A. Uh, question from uh, Gary Sondermeyer, uh, if you guys can see it. So uh, uh, just uh, to answer your question, um, the uh, emissions uh, allowances are first traded out uh, into the industry via an auction, but there is secondary market trading on those uh, emissions allowances on the ICE exchange. And they do in fact have futures um, on these uh, uh, CO2 emissions allowances uh, that are trading in the secondary markets uh, on the ICE. So it is, uh, at the end of the day, I guess a similar idea, you know, there's futures on pulp, there's futures on emissions, there's futures on anything, because the derivative contracts are just a convenient mechanism to uh, uh, offset all kinds of price risks or speculate on them as well. I think that um, it's great to great to hear from Gary. Thanks for that great question, Gary. Um, the I think the emissions trading. Uh, there's recently been futures for that, but there's also just been like a regular type of exchange market for that too. So the pulp futures that were introduced by uh, Steen Ola that he was talking about. Um, that was like for contracts that are going to, you know, exchanges that are going to happen in the, the future versus like a spot market for those types of things. I think there's both a, a spot market and maybe developing a futures market for carbon emissions. I don't know enough about RGGI. Uh, maybe our other panelists do to know if that deals with future emissions or if that's just like a like a spot market or not. Do you do you have any idea, Dan, about that particular one? I'm not sure if the ICE trades uh, these in the uh, spot market. Uh, basically, uh, um, the way our GGI works is that they issue a certain number of uh, CO2 emissions allowances, and then they hold a regular auction where a bunch of parties bid on however much uh, they want to buy, right? Uh, but there is also, I understand, some secondary market trading. Um, Again, I have not actually participated in that market, uh, but uh, uh, I know they have a futures exchange. Uh, uh, the ICE runs a futures market for these allowances. So essentially, I guess people who think they might need more and are not sure how much it will cost at the next auction can enter into the futures contract on the ICE and lock in a price. Or people who have, uh, you know, who anticipate not needing as much, but they'll still bid. <laughs> Uh, and there might be some speculators as well, uh, but uh, I'm not sure if there is like a secondary spot market in addition to the secondary futures market, because I haven't seen that on the ICE and I, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, that's my understanding of how it works. So if anybody has any better ideas, uh, you're more than welcome to uh, correct anything I've said. <laughs> uh, Gary's question also asked, what's the distinction between between this project with recycling and RGGI. And I think the biggest one is that there's one is the greenhouse gas, like you're trading your right to pollute essentially, that you're buying a permit that's tradable for greenhouse gases versus arranging the sale or, or uh, purchase of these physical commodities uh, would be the biggest focus of our project is like finding a market for physical commodities versus this right to pollute. Philip, I know that you had a question too. I think you and Dan started talking at the same time. Uh, do you still have your question there? Uh, just a, a technical question, really. Um, the it mentioned early on in, in Jordan and Daniel's explanation that the price of, uh, of futures depends upon is a factor of underlying commodity prices. But if you don't have underlying commodity prices because the markets are paid and bit in YB, even if futures are going to improve that, I mean, you know, are there are there kind of technical problems in getting things going? Uh, 
So uh, I think it is part of the chicken and the egg uh, problem that Stein Ole has mentioned, right? In order for futures markets to settle regularly and uh, unequivocally, there has to be some kind of a price fix from the underlying market. Uh, and as uh, uh, Jordan has mentioned before, a lot of stuff happens OTC. There is kind of not very good centralized price information. Uh, so one of the things that we will have to come up with is some kind of a reliable pricing index for whatever underlying commodity uh, we're trying to make futures on. Because as you mentioned, right, the, the futures settlement is dependent on the uh, price fix on underlying asset. And we haven't really looked too much into detail of how easy it will be for us to get a reliable uh, price fix. But that's something that we'll definitely have to look into. And if anybody else wants to chime in, uh, feel free. But that's that's what I have. <laughs> Muted. I th you look like you're talking, but I can't hear you. Stan, sorry about that. Yeah, the the folks that are listening and participating that are in the recycling industry will be able to comment more. You know clearly or, or they know better than i am but um like with the pricing one thing that we've been looking at there's a few like sites available that are basically self-reported pricing that you could use you could sort of scrape the data from those sites and use it to create different like price indexes for you know a given commodity but it's all self-reported and it's kind of like ad hoc so um like as far as the you know, determining regular prices or starting out prices, we don't know. And and that's sort of a big challenge, like Dan said, like what, what would opening prices be for some of these commodities? Who knows? You know, we're sort of guessing or, you know, it's almost be, it maybe is uh, comparable in some ways to like at least starting out thinking of like a LIBOR type of situation where you poll participants in the industry, what would they expect to pay for a particular commodity or for a particular a type of recyclable material and maybe that's an opening price that you use and then you can sort of build from there as an index the, that was really the only thought that i've had at this point about um pricing um you know if there's other ideas we'd sure love to hear them at this point <laughs> too um we, we had another question that uh michael jordan and daniel probably very well positioned to answer from kathy she asked can you explain what liquidity is in a derivatives market? I can uh, I can weigh in on one to start. Uh, so when we when we sort of teach liquidity in uh, in, um, in in finance courses, basically think about it as two components, right? So sort of uh, how much do you pay in in transactions costs and how quickly can you do a transaction? So in other words, if you have money tied up in something other than cash, basically one question is, how long would it take you to convert that money to cash? And the second thing is, you know, how much, if you have a dollar worth of whatever asset, how much are you gonna have in cash at the end of it? So a really liquid asset would be something like a treasury security or a very liquid individual stock where uh, it's exchange traded, you can observe that there is a bid ask spread and maybe you'll sell it for uh, a little bit less trading on the bid, but you might get back, you know, $99.80 or 90 cents out of a, out of a hundred dollars. And it's a matter of waiting a few days for the exchange to clear the trade until you have, you know, cash that you can use. So in contrast to that, uh, something like a, a, if you're a homeowner, and you have a house that you can look on Zillow and see that it's, you know, $200,000 value, uh, that doesn't mean that you could turn that house into $200,000 uh, $200, in cash in a matter of days. You're looking at paying several percent in transactions costs and uh, advertising and updates and so on, uh, and looking at several months for the closing process and um, there are assets that are even less liquid than individual houses, such as, you know, factories and, and other big pieces of, uh, of equipment and other large, you know, commercial real estate. So when we think about liquidity, we're basically thinking about how quickly can you turn 
whatever your asset is into cash and uh, how much are you going to have to pay to do that? So the ideal, uh, we always say cash is king. So cash is, you know, the benchmark. Uh, cash is already cash. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to wait. So that's really what we think about in terms of uh, wanting these exchanges to be as, as liquid as possible. Yeah, the one, if I could add to that, um, the one way I would define liquidity is it's the ability to execute a trade without meaningfully moving the, the bid offer spread. So let me give you a real life example. The, the foreign exchange market is arguably the most liquid market in the world with trillions of dollars trading every day. If I want to buy and sell, if, if I would buy and sell, hundred, I could buy and sell a half a billion euros, not even move the market. Um, and the when you're talking about live cattle on the other side, you have to be very careful on how you uh, execute your trades um, because you could potentially move the market very quickly if you're not judicious on how you execute your trades. That, that's great information. Um, I think the last question for our second session here uh, comes again from Samantha McBride. And I think it's been one of the recurring issues from everyone who's spoken and participated so far. She says the uh, material recovery facility operators, so basically people who run recycling plants in the US, the plant operators I know prefer OTC, meaning informal phone-based negotiation forms of buying, selling arrangements. This is deeply entrenched in the waste management industry in the US, especially among medium and small firms. Uh, that's a great insight as much as it is a question. I think the question is how do you how do you convince firms to trade in a different way? And I don't know if you run into that in your your time, Michael. Uh, you know, obviously McDonald's not a small firm by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, did you see evidence of that? Like how did these smaller participants eventually become the large participants and 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 want to engage in exchange traded derivatives versus these kind of one off agreements. Yeah, to that end, I'm going to I'd have to credit uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange um, for role modeling the the activity that an exchange would do to develop these markets. Um, and I'm not just saying that because a couple of their folks are on this call um, over a period of many decades. They did a really good job of bringing buyers, sellers and speculators together and say, OK, what go around the table, let's put our swords down, go around the table and say, what are some of the concerns or what are some of the issues that everybody has or suggestions in order to make a, a successful contract? Um, it's probably the best answer. I've, I've seen that. I've seen that in action and I've seen it work. I've seen the Chicago Mercantile Exchange use that process successfully. I think also uh, that's a that's a great insight, but Samantha, one. One aspect of what we're trying to understand in our project is what would you have to do as far as constructing an exchange to make it attractive and easy to use for these small and medium sized firms that that you describe? Like, how would you get them to want to participate and, and change what their their approach is? So, can I, I, can I, yeah, Philip. Can I chip in? I mean, this is something actually that I was going to touch on at the very end of my my talk. So if people are still around in 40 minutes time, you know, we I might be able to say a bit more about this, but I'll flag it up now. Um, it may be possible to design an exchange in such a way that it builds these kind of entrenched social interactions into the structures of trade rather than trying to outlaw them. And that's exactly what the London Stock Exchange's small company market aim um, did when it started up in the in the mid nineties. So, it, rather than changing behaviour, it may be possible, in fact, to incorporate those kind of behaviours into the 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 regulatory structure of the exchange. And and that that'd be great. You know, if we can hear more about that in the, in a few minutes. Um, we're into the time for our third and final you know block of of this morning. So if we can take a moment to thank uh, Michael Ergong again for, for sharing that information with us and also hearing from Jordan and Daniel. Um, we're in our, our third session now, final session of the morning. We have, we're have we very excited to have two uh, more speakers. Uh, we have, of course, Philip Roscoe, who uh, is a reader. Is that, That's equivalent to associate professor, sort of, right in the U.S. system. 
sort of um yeah sort of senior associate professor not quite professor limbo land that okay. i haven't quite got out of yet okay all right well so anyway philip is, is a reader in management at the school of management at the university of st andrews in scotland philip is a qualitative social scientist interested in markets how markets are organized and how they work as organizing devices He's a leading member of the growing field of market studies, an approach informed by uh, science and technology studies, sociology, accounting, and organizational studies. His work emphasizes the ethical and political dimensions of markets. He's the author of I Spend, Therefore I Am, as well as dozens of other papers and projects. He's also the one-man show behind the very excellent podcast series, which is called How to Build the Stock Exchange. Um, Okay, well, let me see what I can do. Um, if I share my screen, if I share the PowerPoint, that might be even better. And um, I will show the slideshow. So hopefully you can hear me and you can see these slides and we, we're good to go. Super. Yeah, okay. Looks good. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much. And I'll press the little clock as well on my desktop so I. I know what's going on. Thank you all very much for the uh, for the invitation um, and for the generous introduction, Jordan. So you all know who I am. Greetings from the um, from the east coast of Scotland, and um, thank you very much to all the speakers so far. It's been a really fascinating few presentations, and I have to say, Michael, portfolio theory has never been so delicious. Um, so I've been asked, or Jordan has asked me to talk about the social connections that underpin markets. And I think that's very relevant to the kind of conversation that we've been having uh, so far this morning, because we've had two parallel stories in a sense. We've had one that is very much out of economics where um, the participants sort of seem to have dropped out and we tend to, we, we, we kind of understand markets as if they've always, they've always been um, as they are and they're not based anywhere or placed anywhere. We've had another that has come from our industry participants where we see that markets are very much kind of in, uh, embedded, involved in social relations, what industry participants want to do or what the organizational constraints allow them to do all of these kind of things. So my, um, my, my, my sort of thesis, if you like, is that those social connections drop in and out of, of economic thinking about markets they are, in fact, omnipresent in the practical problem of organizing. And this is not always the case. So Adam Smith, of course, talked about, you know, beneficially, mutually beneficial competition between the um, between the, 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 the butcher and the brewer and the baker. Um, but by the time we get to the 20th century, Frederick Hayek's talking about the market as a great kind of, you know, uh, computer at the center of a self-organizing economic process with entrepreneurs twiddling the dials on this kind of steam steampunk engine machine that are, that are, that, are, that that he he clearly imagines and that continues so by the time we get to the um, the portfolio theory um, and efficient market hypothesis of the latter part of the 20th century and contemporary economic conceptions of of how finance how, how derivatives work people and spaces have and the places of the market have dropped out altogether. It's not to denigrate the uh, the achievements of financial economics, not at all, but simply to observe that we know our, we know ourselves, you know, one's interactions in the yard sale with one's neighbors uh, or the car boot sale, as we might do on this side of the Atlantic, um, are very different from the interactions we might have as kind of globally distributed participants in um, some kind of financial market. So, I don't know if there are any other uh, sociologists in the room. Shout out to all the sociologists here today. I think not. Um, but the, a, a persistent strand of uh, economic sociology has understood markets as as made up and held together by by um, social connections and um, embedded in the social, to use the terminology of Mark Granovetter in 1973. I should say I've I've sent Jordan some um, a PDF of these slides and all the references are on the back. If you would like to see them, perhaps he will circulate them after the after the event. But anyway, a couple of standout studies to illustrate this point. Um, Brian Uzi's study of uh, garment manufacturers in New York in the early 1990s and Wayne Baker's 
study of the Chicago trading pits um, in the early 19, 1980s. Now, in different ways, what both of these studies showed is that uh, market participants will don't they don't act like economic theory proposes that they should. They will accept worse prices. Um, they they they're not individualist. They're not atomized. They collaborate. Um, they they as I say, they will accept um, that work worth worse prices, they'll extend lines of credit, they'll help each other out in times of trouble because they value the safety and security that comes through trading with known counterparts. And I think it's very interesting that we've heard that from the um, uh, experts in, in the recycling industry, that this is how these guys work. They work person to person and they don't necessarily want to work in any other, other way. So in financial markets, does the social still matter? I mean, you know, financial markets now don't look like the two pictures I've just shown you. They're very dated. They look like there are screens, and wires and data flows and perhaps telephones, algorithms, you know, vast trading rooms humming quietly away with traders sitting in them. And 90 percent of equities trading globally is now done algorithmically. So without the involvement of any humans at all. Well, there's a, uh, a lot of sociological research on this topic, and, and the first uh, most sort of standout uh, um, piece that I draw attention to is one by uh, Nor Satina and Brueger in 2002 of these trading rooms. And they suggest that, in fact, market traders or traders in, front, in bond markets they're looking at occupy these same kinds of communities as the sort of you know Smithy and Butcher and Baker, microstructured, densely tied and connected communities, but these are distributed globally. These are sort of mediated and wired into the technology and they move around the globe as the sun goes and markets close and open and, uh, and so forth. So even though technological advances have reshaped markets, so the social connections that hold them together remain they've simply been worked into these uh worked into these technologies in particular ways um my own work has shown how the norms of trading are worked into the material devices of trade reproducing uh social mores and you might even and here i'm slightly off my patch but you might even argue that um trading algorithms high frequency algorithms capture something of their their makers in how they operate and this is one of the bases on which uh, uh, regulators tackle the problems of dealing with them there's also compelling evidence to show that in the absence of bodies traders buy numbers back into stories and commentaries about people and I, i've sat and watched traders at work who talk their way through the the dense narrative of of who is doing what behind this stream of supposedly anonymous numbers. So in a sense, um, you know, this, despite the, the digitization and the technologization of markets, these underlying claims about social relationships and connection of traders still hold good. But more than that, I'd like to stress that markets themselves are social projects. And this is something that we've really heard this morning in the in the presentations from industry. Uh, they are, these markets have histories, they have path dependencies, they take particular shapes because of the, the way that things are worked out for them. They're embedded in particular spaces in social communities and they have political entanglements from the outset. So I think I can show you that with a, with a brief couple of examples from these pictures. The first of them on the on the left there, that's Jonathan's Coffee House in Threadneedle Street in the city of city of London. Uh, no, sorry, in Exchange Alley in the city of London, just around the corner from where the Bank of England now stands. Um, and this is where or this is one of the locations where the early stock traders in London used to meet in the uh, in the late 17th, early 18th century. What were they trading? Well, primarily they were trading the stock in the early joint stock companies, which were the Bank of England, um, the uh, infamous um, South Sea Company of the South Sea Bubble, the also infamous East India Company of the uh, British colonial exploitation of India, and the not so well known but, but even more egregious Royal Africa Company, which was um, crucial in the slaving triangle um, in the 17th century. And all of these were 
effectively engines of, of colonialist expansion for the English government, which was broke. And what they did, they went off and they conducted their, their various trades. They lent money to the English to the English government, which spent it on colonialist exploits, such as trying to hang on to America. And um, in return, the uh, they issued stock through their they, they 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 passed this debt through their balance sheet. They issued stock, which was traded to the rich merchants of London. So instead of taxing merchants, the the uh, the stock exchange became a kind of money laundering service for for national debt, which was extremely illiquid into liquid uh, equities and securities. And what happened then, once these, this exchange became established, was that they bought a building. The richer, richer jobbers, as they were known, bought a building in Threadneedle Street, and they began to charge access to their junior, less well-established peers. This shows us something else that social theory tells us about, about markets, and that Steen's talk exemplified, that high-status actors within marketplaces will systematically use their power and position in order to maintain profitable opportunities at the extent of, of others. And you can draw a, a continuous line of, of more or less uninterrupted trading and trading style to uh, the next picture you see, which is London's old stock exchange, probably in the 1960s. This was before, and, and this system was only abandoned in 1986, seven, sorry, in London's Big Bang. Um, an ambulatory system of trading that had co-evolved with the market where people walked around and they looked at prices displayed on pictures and they did deals face to face. On the right hand side, you can see this is probably a more familiar, uh, familiar story, particularly for many in this, this uh, webinar. Um, it, that's the um, second, I think, building of the Chicago Board of Trade. Um, the Chicago Board of Trade appeared as an association of politicians and businessmen who wanted to help the city uh, and build its agricultural and political prestige, as well as to build a market. And within that, this became a, a club for businessmen. Within that, uh, we, we saw a standardization of contracts and then the arrival of to arrive contracts. And the, 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 the wonderful thing about a to arrive contract was that it never had to arrive. And this is the settled in cash contracts that we've been talking about now. Um, and this was also a reflection of the, the linkage of railway networks that came into the city and then the telegraph lines that were, were, were laid along the railway tracks. You know, so Chicago becomes materially a center of, 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 of economic action as well. And this, too, develops into eventually the, the crowned by the legislation of derivative trading is coming out of the um, the. the the legalization, sorry, of derivative trading coming out of this battle between uh, the bucket shop magnate C.C. Christie and the Chicago Board of Trade, where Justice Holmes of the Supreme Court ruled that speculation by competent men is the self-adjustment of society to the probable. So speculation is a good thing. All of which is to show, and this is exactly the point that that, uh, that um, Jordan and Daniel were making early on. You know, specu speculation has its place and, and uh, isn't necessarily a, a bad thing to be outlawed, not at all. But all of this is to show that these markets have historical, uh, historical um, uh, technological material and social backgrounds that shape the way they are and how they how they um, come to come to be. And in the markets that I've studied, such as the London Stock Exchange's junior market AIM, this was quite literally talked into being. Uh, unlike Steen, AIM didn't have to worry about the infrastructure of settlement because it was already there. What they did is created a market out of talk, out of telling stories about what, you know, what was going to happen in this place when it finally, finally happened. Um, and, um, you know, the, the market just it just it just launched it, it had in, acquired a sort of discursive presence before it, it came into being but it's important to add as well that social connections are not always a good thing so just to give you some examples again um innovation in small groups coupled with social prestige is not always a good thing so on the right hand side we have a sort of a, a story there louis ranieri of salomon brothers um who's group uh, worked very hard to legalize mortgage 
is uh, and a very profitable boom and bust of, of bond trading there, combined with the JP Morgan diaspora of uh, collateralized debt obligations that also spread from, you know, a leading, a leading elite small, small group. And of course, that combination ended up in the, uh, the credit crisis of, of 2008. Um, social networks can also be cliquey or present barriers to entry. So moving from the grand to the much more small scale, my work with Yuha Sang Chen uh, has documented how Taiwanese retail investors often participate in retail investing precisely because it is a, um, a, a status passage, a, meaning, a means of gaining access to closed groups and so forth. Social networks can be inefficient. Donald McKenzie shows us how the collapse of long-term capital management is in effect, uh, or was in many ways, the produce of social, or the result of social networks, because these hedge fund managers, they all knew each other. They all been to, to, to college together. They worked together. They drank in the same places, you know, all of these kind of things. And they knew, they knew where the smart money was and they watched and they did the same thing. And this imitative effect produced a super portfolio that effectively greatly magnified the results of the ruble crisis in 1998 and caused all sorts of problems. And finally, social networks, social connections can reproduce uh, inequalities. And there's a very fine ethnography by Karen Ho of recruitment in, uh, 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 into Wall Street among elite universities and particularly Princeton, which reproduces, as she shows, um, particular kinds of gendered class and race distinctions, I think that we should all be very aware of at uh, the current time. For this reason, regulators have often seek to enforce a dominant conception of market governments. This is associated, I think, with the Chicago School of Eugene Farmer and the efficient market hypothesis, where informational efficiency uh, equals allocative efficiency. And this is built into the material technological structure of markets. I think we've seen that again in um, Steen's uh, presentation particularly. And that's set against the habits of those used who are used to trading in the uh, in the over the counter kind of kind of markets, Jordan, I've completely lost track of time. How am I? How am I doing? Well, it's okay. I mean, if if you want to get close to to wrapping up your remarks, so we have time for questions and, okay. and hearing from Christian okay. Venom. Okay, let's do that. Um, so there are various reasons why um, social connections still matter for organ for organizational reasons such as innovation and learning. Um, there's a lot of concern about the instabilities of uh, high frequency trading um, and suggestions that social connections maintain um, uh, exchanges in time of crisis. But just to finish up then, I'd, I'd, I'd like to mention the London Stock Exchange's aim, which dealt with this problem of inherent social uh, social connections, people who are habituated to trading over the counter by factoring that into the into the regulatory structure of the market. And what they did was rather than taking the uh, regulation in house, they outsourced it to the corporate financiers, the advisors who are bringing um, bringing companies to market. It's the advisor's job to bring uh, good good goods to market. And this works because it's a small world and everyone knows each other. It's a producer market, much more like a kind of commodity market. And if someone you know, produces something that isn't up to scratch, then they won't be doing business anymore. And this has been very, very successful to the extent where companies, rather than leaving AIM to move to the main board, have actually joined it. So they've moved, they've moved down notionally rather than up. So the concluding thoughts to, to leave you then, markets are deeply embedded in the social. These social connections are often viewed as problematic but they needn't be. They can be a source of trust, of market stability and robustness of information flow. And it's possible to regulate social connections in, not out. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right. Th thank you, Philip. That was very interesting. So I, I was wondering if, if we had any questions for Philip Roscoe, uh, who was sharing this information about social dimensions. Philip, have you done any work on on derivatives, I know most of your stuff is focused on equities markets in particular, but any of the commodities and other types of aspects of, of markets that we focused on this morning? 
No, I, I must confess, I, I haven't. I mean, there is there is some literature on on derivatives, and some of the some of the stuff I return I referred to about um, trading rooms, particularly, is based in derivative markets and bond markets. Um, and there is um, there's there's yeah, there's, I mean, there, there is some interesting literature uh, it, it ongoing, but it's not an area that I'm expert in. I'm afraid. You're muted, Jordan. Um, colonial projects in particular from the early days of equities trading would seem to have a lot to do with, with ideas of commodities. And you mentioned like stories that traders would tell about riches in these other places that England were headed to colonize. I imagine that that focused on the type of like mineral and natural wealth that was there to be exploited more so than anything else. I'm sorry, I missed the very beginning of that of that question. It seems as even though you haven't done a lot of work on commodities, it seems like much of the initial trading around like you know, the, the East India Company or the African Company probably focused a lot on commodities as far as what it is that people were telling stories about. I, I, th I think this is this is true. I, I wonder if it also involved a degree of separation. So, for example, there's, um, you know, the 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 Royal Africa Country uh, Company was um, a, an engine of the crown that was chartered to trade in slaves, um, and and they 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 built and occupied forts down the the west coast of Africa, and they transacted with the privately manned merchant vessels that that that, that went out. Um, and similarly, you know, there's a great growing credit institution of uh, a sort of collateralized on the bodies of these poor souls who are being shipped across the uh, shipped across the Atlantic. And I think one of the interesting things that that this that this does is it also it also separates. So on the one hand, you know, you might have a conversation, uh, uh, stories of riches that can be made in 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 far off in the trade and all the other things. But on the other hand, you also don't you don't have to get your hands dirty. And I don't I wonder if that's kind of of relevance to this discussion, because, you know, how many speculators in pork bellies would like to to go to the meat packing factory or the same with the recycling plants or or, or what have you? That's a very two edged two edged sword. Um, Our other speaker in this session is uh, Rostin Benham, who's joining us. Uh... Uh, Rawson Benham is a commissioner at the U.S. Commodities Futures Trading Commission, who is sworn to serve a term ending June 2021. With a background in law as well as equities trading, Commissioner Benham has held several positions in business and finance, including working on the staff of Michigan Senator Debbie Stabenow, where he worked on the implementation of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, the 2013 Pesticide Registration Improvement Act, the 2014 Farm Bill, and the 2016 Bioengineered Food Disclosure Standard. Since joining the CFTC, Commissioner Benham has advocated that the agency utilize its authority and expertise to ensure that derivatives markets innovate responsibly with an appropriate oversight framework and promoting coordination and engagement among financial regulators and innovators. He's the sponsor of the CFTC's Market Risk Advisory a committee, including the climate risk, climate change risk subcommittee that recently launched, uh, where he convenes leading market experts and consumer groups to engage in a public dialogue on timely issues relating to market structure and movement of risk across clearinghouses, exchanges, intermediators, and end users. So, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I wanted to, I'll use my time, I'll try to be quick because I don't know how long this is going to last. I'm just talking a little bit about the CFTC. Um, my role as a commissioner, what we do, and sort of the history of the agency. It's been interesting to listen into the context and the, the issues discussed, and it's nice to hear the sort of 101 for the students and the listeners because these products are complicated, but they sort of integrate themselves into every element of our economy, and they have for many, many decades. Um, so it's good to see and think about innovation in the recycling space and some of these sustainability um, issues that I think you're addressing. And I think there's always more room in the derivative space for innovation, for creativity, because it's price discovery and risk management. And to, to be able to do that, I think ensures a growing stable economy and jobs and all the good things I think we all support um, for, for the country and the world. 
So the commission is a five member commission. Um, probably a lot of your students are familiar with obviously the Securities Exchange Commission, um, the FTC, the FCC, there's a number of commissions in the, in the in US government. Um, we have uh, three of the commissioners are of the same political party, two are of the minority party. In the case of the current Trump administration, there are three Republicans. I'm one of the Democrats um, on, on the panel. We work very collegially together. We have to sort of navigate policy issues, obviously within the scope of what Congress and the law requires us to do. Um, but the whole point of the commissions is to sort of work collaboratively and sort of uh, allow the, the, the sort of uh, tension and, and the, the friction of debate to come out with the best policy um, um, outcomes uh, with respect to derivatives markets. We are the exclusive derivatives regulator in the US. Uh, we have an interesting his history and some of this was commented earlier, obviously using the examples. I know Daniel used the examples of agricultural products and Jordan did too. We actually were originate, the CFTC originates in the US Department of Agriculture um, going back over 100 years and not until 1975 when financial futures really started to emerge as a huge part of the derivatives market did Congress decide to spin out the CFTC from within the USDA and create an independent agency. So we have a very rich history in agricultural products that is the sort of root of um, what derivatives uh, are and how they sort of um, uh, evolved and developed over time. Obviously, tons of history with Chicago, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Board of Trade. Um, but it's interesting to look at the statistics and where the market is now. And it's, it's less than 5% of, of products traded are agricultural and energy, sort of these core uh, commodities um, that folks typically think of when they think of commodities. Now, Financials, whether it's um, interest rates and currencies, as was mentioned earlier, are really the predominant um, uh, majority of, of derivatives traded. Uh, within the commission, obviously, like I said, we have the five commissioners. One is appointed chair, and the chair sort of runs the show. It's his or her agenda um, to, to operate the agency, and we all sort of work together, like I said, to come up with policy, changing rules, sort of adapting both with the law and as the market sort of changes and, and uh, evolves, we have to uh, also adapt our rules to better um, address those changes. And, you know, as Philip mentioned, the role in emergence of technology, which I'll get to in a little bit, that has certainly made us think about what our role is uh, within the context of the market and how we have to play an effective role to oversee and surveil the markets. Um, within the commission, we have a number of divisions, the division of clearing and risk, which oversees clearing houses, which, exchange traded futures, you know, uh, sort of a, a major part as some of your, your students might learn is you have the exchanges where the contracts are traded, um, but the, the clearing houses act as a buyer to every seller and a seller to every buyer. And this is really what makes um, futures contracts, given the fact that they're leveraged contracts, um, very resilient and safe in many respects. And there's many lessons to be learned from 2008, but one of them, if you look at some of the books of the large investment banks, their futures books were actually very um, stable and they were stable because of the, the cleared element of, uh, of the products. And I think that was a lesson that we all learned and Congress certainly learned when they were implementing the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, another division is the Division of Market Oversight, which oversees the exchanges, which is the Chicago Board of Trade, ICE, uh, among many other exchanges that we have. Those are two of the biggest. Um, DSIO, which is the swap and intermediary oversight, which really oversees the intermediaries, the brokers. Our major brokers are futures commission merchants, FCMs, swap dealers, um, within the sort of asset management space, CTAs and CPOs, commodity trading advisors and pool operators, and then introducing brokers and um, associated persons who are sort of really the network and the ecosystem of how trades are conducted and the sort of network of um, the end user all the way up to the exchange uh, and the product being executed. Our constituency is probably one of the things I really love about my job. Um, like I said, you know, the CFTC and derivatives writ large, we are a part of everyone's everyday life, whether it's gas you put in your car, whether it's bread you buy at the grocery store, whether it's a car you buy at a, at a lot. Um, so we have, you know, the main investment institutions, whether it's the buy side firms or the sell side firms as a major constituency, farmers and ranchers, as the examples were, uh, you know, uh, told a little bit earlier, are huge and obviously a historical part of our constituency, which I mentioned earlier. 
pension funds, so um, in investment management, 401ks, and and state pensions uh, and, and federal pensions for for individuals across the country, and manufacturers, whether it's um, you know car manufacturers, McDonald's, as as was mentioned earlier by Michael, um, and energy companies uh, across the entire um, value chain of energy from from drillers to the retail gas station. So. There are products across the board, wide spectrum, um, and, and it is really sort of in, in one of the things that I relish of the job is being able to both, you know, go to New York, go to Chicago, travel overseas to London or Asia, um, but also head to the Midwest and, and visit a farm or a co-op or a grain elevator and sort of see um, some of the constituents and what I need to be doing better as a regulator to ensure that these markets are sort of um, doing what they need to do, which again is price discovery and risk management. Um, we, like I mentioned, implement the law, which is the Commodity Exchange Act, uh, and we do that through rules and regulations, um, which you know it's quite extensive, but you know a huge market, and, and we are constantly tinkering and tweaking uh, the rules to better sort of represent um, what the market uh, looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, and I think, as many uh, people know, and as you mentioned in the introduction. The last major overhaul of our law was in 2010, which was actually just about 10 years ago last week, uh, the anniversary of Dodd-Frank. Um, but again, Michael mentioned about uh, swaps earlier about swapping out um, price risk and counterparty credit risk. Prior to 2008, and this was a theme that many of the listeners might know if you think about AIG and some of these um, OTC over-the-counter swaps that were unregulated, um, those are now regulated, and a bulk of them are. Many are still over the counter that are more bespoke, but one of the main goals of Dodd Frank, especially with respect to derivatives, was moving a lot of these over counter derivatives onto exchange, requiring clearing, requiring reporting, requiring best practices, um, and then also for those contracts that remain OTC, uh, which is necessary because there are very bespoke deals and contracts that need to be executed requiring capital and certain margin requirements for those products. So a, a huge transformation in terms of the regulatory sphere, but one that I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who didn't think it was the right thing to do. And it certainly was the right time given what we dealt with in 2008 and the role derivatives, unregulated derivatives played um, in the crisis. Um, one thing I think that is uh, more appropriate for this conversation and certainly would welcome questions to this, but you know, something I think about constantly is, What's the future of the market? Um, Philip obviously mentioned some of the, the evolution of the markets over time and as we're becoming more digitized and algorithmic. Uh, and we see this with our, our constituents. Obviously COVID pushed a lot of traders from uh, the remaining traders who are going into offices or even the remaining few products that are traded on floors. There's some options that still have uh, floor pits, but we have seen this, especially in the past few years, but largely for the past two decades, this evolution of trading away from the traditional uh, pits of Chicago or New York or London um, to your desk, uh, uh, wherever you might be in the world. And as that has emerged from a single trader to um, algorithms uh, and electronic trading writ large, I think we have to, as a regulator, reevaluate sort of how we do our job, being nimble um, and addressing some of the risks that, um, that are emerging on a day-to-day -day basis. And those are difficult because we have to, you know, we, we tend to be behind the curve on technology. Uh, these institutions are, are obviously have a, a ton of resources and are constantly looking for edge. Um, and with that, we have to keep track of how the market evolves and how it moves. And I would say, you know, one good example is um, some of the cryptocurrencies. I started at the commission in September of 17, and Bitcoin, for those of you who don't remember, actually peaked um, near $20,000, if not just crossing that threshold in December of 17. And the first Bitcoin futures contracts were listed on both CME and SIBO in December of 18. Two different products, two different structures in, in terms of how um, the derivatives functioned and what their underlying assets uh, were. Um, but ultimately, it was a it was really a huge transformation, and one to be uh, for me personally to be uh, it was very interesting to be a part of. Of uh, you saw the market demand, and and this theme has existed, I think, in the conference for the past two hours. Is this market is about participants finding the need for price discovery and risk management, uh, and from a regulator standpoint, I view that as the the key thing, right? I I have a set of rules and regulations that I have to enforce. 
Um, we oversee the exchanges, we oversee the clearing houses, both the exchanges and the clearing houses obviously play a huge role in self-regulating to an extent, but we have a very healthy relationship and one that I think we rely on um, in a very reciprocal way. Uh, but as, as the market evolves and the market develops and these new products um, emerge, as a regulator, we are agnostic to price, certainly and above all else. I get that question a lot about how, you know, you saw the oil moves in April and May. What did the regulator do? How did you influence it? We did not influence it. We have a set of rules and regulations to, to follow and to enforce, but the market drives the price of commodities. Um, obviously, regulations can affect prices, but generally speaking, we are agnostic to prices. Um, and, and as a general matter, we're, we are supportive of emerging technologies and emerging products. We just have to make sure they follow um, sort of uh, the, the box of rules and regulations that uh, we are required to implement by Congress. So as we continue to see these emerging technologies and certainly with the products that you're introducing through recyclables, um, we, we take a really very uh, unbiased, objective approach to ensuring all products sort of follow within the suite of rules and regulations that um, we are required to, to implement. And I'll give you one quick, more weedy example that I think is helpful of how we interact with exchanges and the market uh, as a general matter. And this came up certainly within the context of the Bitcoin contracts. Um, there are two provisions in our rule, uh, part 40 of our rule, and these specifically relate to products um, and as they're being launched on exchanges. There are really two avenues that exchanges can take when they want to introduce new products. Uh, and this was a debate that I think went on during the, the crypto asset and the Bitcoin asset launch uh, back in 2017. You have an option as an exchange to either um, introduce uh, a product and sort of report to the agency that you've um, introduced the product. You work sort of over a course of weeks and months before you launch the product to make sure it sort of conforms with our rules and re regulations, but it really becomes a, a self notice more than anything else. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a methodology that was introduced about 20 years ago. And the underlying sort of policy purpose was to incentivize more products to be listed for trading. And if you really, if you look at a chart of products listed at some of the largest exchanges pre-2000 and post-2000 when the law was implemented and the policy was uh, put in place by the CFTC, it's a huge curve upward in terms of new products. And I think there's good and bad with it. Ultimately, I think the good outweighs the bad because we want new products, we want new ways to manage risk. And this um, sort of self-reporting, for, for to put it in as simplest terms as possible, I think gave the market and gave exchanges the opportunity to go through a set of requirements, sort of check the box, you know, for lack of a better word, and then really just introduce uh, self, essentially certify the contract before or not having to get approval from the, the CFTC. The other method is to actually get formal approval. And that takes a little bit longer, uh, but I think it gives the exchange and um, uh, the sort of market participants, participants a little bit more certainty of what they're getting and, and a, a little bit more of a sign off from the agency. For the most part, vast, vast majority uh, of the products are self-certified. They don't go through the approval process, but that I think I wanted to raise that for the audience because it was a question that I raised during the Bitcoin launch was, you have these a very novel product, something we had never seen listed on an exchange before globally. Um, the underlying contract was largely unregulated being the spot market. The data information and the data flow was really unclear of how it was going to come and go between the exchange and the spot market. These things were still learning, but at the time it was very fresh and very new. So I just raised the question, if there ever was a time to sort of have an approval process, was this the time? And had a healthy debate among the commission and my, my colleagues. In the end, the exchanges uh, went to go the, the self-certification route, which was fine. They did the work they needed to do, and we continue to oversee the the contracts and work with them on a daily basis, both from a sort of exchange traded function, but also from a clearing function and getting all the data and the reporting we need. So that's one sort of element I wanted to share with the audience. And on a daily basis, um, you know, our, our divisions are constantly working with the exchanges and the clearing houses. We're doing surveillance. We're certainly doing enforcement. We bring a number of enforcement actions over the course of the year, um, obviously to, you know, um, 
uh, to ensure that we're enforcing our law uh, um, as best we can. But these are these are the challenges, and it's a great example of the challenges we're seeing as the as the market continually evolves and becomes more technology driven. How do we as a regulator keep up um, and maintain transparent, fair, and safe markets for the public? Um, price discovery is a huge, huge element of our markets. I've mentioned it multiple times. It cannot be understated, and I know a lot of the speakers know this, but um, the price discovery that occurs on the exchanges within our markets are reference prices across the globe for so many different contracts, whether it's um, you know, home pricing and mortgages to crop insurance for agriculture. Um, these are reference prices that it becomes so important that we have accurate, fair pricing free from fraud and manipulation so that all of these derivative, no, no pun intended, contracts um, and relationships are fair and balanced and properly uh, reflect um, cash market prices in, in the marketplace for any number of commodities. So I will stop there. I managed to get through without being interrupted or, or cut off by technology itself, uh, ironically yeah. talking about this. Um, but I hope that gives folks a little bit of sense of what we do. Um, we're a very proud agency um, and one that I think continues to grow and emerge as a leader globally, especially after 2008 and 2010. And I would just emphasize to you um, as you're sort of to think about these products in the recycling space, I'm doing a bit uh, myself on climate change and climate risk um, at the CFTC, You're hoping to have a report out in the next month or so. Um, but sustainability and some of these new emerging risks that we're facing, I think, um, derivatives can be a huge part of managing those risks. Um, and I certainly hope from a policy perspective, we take a stronger foot forward on um, introducing uh, better risk management practices. But, you know, to, to your product, certainly, I think if the market is there, has, that has been mentioned, I know Michael mentioned it, if the market's there, you have buyers and sellers, if you have the end users and the liquidity providers, um, these contracts can be very useful and can be um, great support for our, for our economy. So I'll stop there. Welcome any questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, yep. one, one question I had for you and for Philip, and I think you'll answer it different ways because you deal with different types of financial products, but why do you think that financial innovations succeed or fail? Like, why does a particular contract really take off from your perspective or some other type of innovation, like what's the difference between a successful new product or a new exchange and one that that fails? Philip, I don't know, you want to jump in or I can go first, whatever. No, you please, please go first. I would say quickly, and I'm sure we can go back and forth on this, but having experienced this in the past, you know, 10 or 20 years, a lot of it relies on research and doing your homework, for lack of a better word. Um, and the, the more sophisticated, what I find is the more sophisticated, well-prepared exchanges have very good relationships with their clients, are interacting with them on a regular, if you can think about, you know, you're talking about a, a, a contract for recycling, you're obviously, I talked about the crypto assets. These are very, very unique contracts that um, are so new uh, that they're really revolutionary in the sense of creating a new uh, space in the market. But you can look, you know, cheese was mentioned earlier, obviously oil, any of the, the minerals, um, the, ag the ags, there are so many varieties and different types of contracts um, in the energy space that represent different uh, risks that market participants face. And they're almost just become offshoots and derivatives of each other as market participants say, you know what, this contract is good, but I, if we could tweak it a little bit, it would be better representative of the risks I face and I'd be able to manage that risk better. So I think a short answer to your question is, those who do their homework, those who are engaging with the exchange, realizing what their clients need, and really figuring out and building sort of inertia around the market and the product before it's launched, really become more successful uh, than those who don't do that work. And I think we've had enough experience over decades that, you know, there's there are a lot of exchanges, but there's really not that many. Especially if you think about in the U.S., there are two major exchanges for energy and ags, the financials being CME and ICE. Um, obviously, there's a, a number of others, but the, the majors are there. These guys know what they're doing. We work very closely with them and seeing how they 
in a very sophisticated manner, work with their clients and really do the prep work before launch of a contract. They certainly have failed contracts, but there's no doubt about that. But by and large, they do their work so that when they do launch them, because there's a lot of research by economists and a lot of resources that have to go into the launch of a contract. Um, and they certainly have a lot of incentives to do the work to make it successful. So if I think you're on mute. I, I would have given almost exactly the same answer. I, I think. I think. I mean, in the UK, in the small company space, which is the one I've, I've researched, there've been there've been quite a few attempts to start markets, um, and some of those attempts have got licenses. You know, they've got the regulatory trappings. They've been acknowledged in their in the Houses of Parliament, whatever, and and yet they haven't they haven't succeeded. And it seems to me that it's just brutally hard work, and that seemed to be what our first speaker was. Um, was was discovering as well that they, I mean clearly there has to be a market clearly there has to be demand clearly there has to be an appropriate framework and the time has to be right and all of those things but still this this kind of existential chicken and egg problem at, that, that faces any exchange startup can only be overcome by really really copious effort on the part of the the founders. Yeah. Okay, other, other questions from our other panelists or audience members? I don't think any questions have come in. Uh, uh, I, would, uh, I had a uh, question slash thought. I was just wondering if you think it uh, um, is a more reasonable proposition to try to partner with an existing exchange like the CME uh, or something and work with them to introduce these new products or if it makes more sense to like have our own separate exchange for those products like because you said that they already have a whole bunch of processes and people in place they know how all these things operate they know how to bootstrap things uh, so uh, would that uh, have a greater chance of success if we could convince them to take an interest in uh, these particular products? Or like, what do you think? I, if we're talking about introducing products, I would certainly, um, especially from a regulatory perspective, I would encourage working with exchanges. And it doesn't have to be a CME. As I mentioned, there are a number of exchanges, smaller exchanges that are actually offering unique, more bespoke products. Um, but there are, again, from a regulatory perspective, there's a whole different set of requirements that you would have to then abide by, would cost capital in order to form an exchange that's focused on uh, recyclables or you know, sort of the sustainability. I, I, and I would imagine those are gonna start to emerge. Mm, and I don't think from your standpoint, it would be worth the capital um, expenditure to have to do essentially two things, both form an exchange and then list products, as opposed to seeing if an existing exchange who has compliance, who has put in the time and the regulatory um, bandwidth really to get the exchange up and running and functioning, and then just listing products on top of that. Um, again, I, I think that's, you know, that's my general gut reaction. Obviously, any number of things could, could differ depending on what your long-term vision is. If you have a grander vision for an exchange that's focused on recyclables or on sustainable contracts, then maybe that comes down the road. But if you're thinking about at least as a first step listing a contract, um, I think you would uh, uh, be better served in, in working and partnering with an existing exchange that has all those um, licenses and requirements already uh, um, in the shop and in sort of avoiding that cost that would be pretty significant. If I if I can chip it, I think there's there are kind of technological issues as well, aren't there? Because the exchanges are really complicated. Yeah. And and if you can, you I I actually don't see that there's any option but to white label somebody else's machinery at the very at the very least. I just don't see how a startup could produce a, an exchange from from nothing that would be you know satisfactory for customers and regulators and and investors. We heard some of that from from Steen Ola's talk at the beginning was 
you know, they had a concept that then they had to find partners on which to actually like handle the, the plumbing of trading, so to speak, and all the clearing and, and all that business. So, yeah, it seems uh, so, so hard to get it up and running. Um, any other questions from our, our panelists or audience this morning? We've actually hit the end of our event time here at noon. Um, but I, I don't think anything's come in through the Q&A box or any other uh, questions or comments for our panelists. No? Okay. Well, thanks to everyone who participated this morning, whether you're a panelist, a, a speaker, or, or to someone writing in with questions and listening. Hopefully you found it useful and informative. Uh, we're very excited about our project and we'll keep everyone posted as we sort of work our way through it.